Welcome to You in HD, your identity in higher definition with Pastor Eric Miller. Join us in our journey of faith in God by taking an in-depth look into the Bible's authority and sufficiency to guide us in our Christian walk. Discover your identity in Jesus Christ today. What to do when we are suffering and being dealt with in our sins. I did say I'd get this episode out today on the 9th. Uh, it's been a, a rough day, a tough day. Um, when you're going through it, uh, it is unimaginable how hard it is to um, stay focused, uh, keep your spirits up, but it becomes easier as you focus on Christ more than anything else. I like to be a man of my word if I can. And I've been great at it uh, over the years, of course. Uh, the 2019 has been a pretty a pretty strong discipline year for me. Uh, I felt the Lord has been very kind to me and helping me discipline myself better. And so I've been working uh, by following the very things that God has laid out for all of us to do just by adhering to his word even more so than more than I ever, ever could on my own, of course, because only with his strength can we do it. But talking about suffering and, and when we're dealt with our sins, it's, it's, I wanted to make an episode that was a snapshot of what that looks like, because we can go into a broad category of what it's like when we sin. And then it can go into why is these kind of why why is this person suffering from poverty? Why is this person suffering in abuse and 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 to tie all those things together? So I'm trying to just get a snapshot of one aspect of what happens when we sin and how God disciplines us. And I think that's the that's where I want to try to stay focused. Not that those other things aren't important, but that goes into the greater question of why does God allow suffering? And that's a whole nother episode, a whole nother sermon into itself. So I want to give us a snapshot of what happens when we are in our sins and we've been, you know, convicted of our sins, not condemned, mind you. No Christian is condemned in their sins if you are in Christ. If you sin today, God will not condemn you for those sins. You can be disciplined. You can be chastened, but you will not be condemned. God does not recall back his salvation. Don't, don't, don't believe what they're trying to sell and peddle to you. When you are saved by Christ, you are saved to the uttermost. You will see heaven guaranteed. There's no maybe. There's no might. Let's go to John chapter 10 just to see this reality. Because, you know, I, I believe in once saved, always saved, not based on works, but based on what the word of God says in his own hand. We go down to verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And that should give us some comfort. And give us an identity understanding as well. Because, you know, UNHD is about identity. And I've not done a really good job of painting that picture over the years because I've struggled trying to articulate it myself. But having a better grasp of it, I understand what it is you know, getting to understand what that means. Anytime you want to be reading the scripture going forward, I'm going to point out our identity, how we're known and how we'll be able to be seen and be known by God, of course. So here's another one. My sheep, he's taking ownership of your mind. My children, my sheep. And we know his voice, we hear his voice. When we read the Bible and understand what the Bible is saying, we hear the Holy Spirit crying out for us, we understand what's happening. So what happens in our sins when, when, when this is going on? Well, we can go to Job's friends and see Job's friends actually made, made a good point. Now, though they're probably the worst accountability partners you've ever seen in your life, all of us can relate to these accountability partners because simply just give bad advice. No comfort whatsoever. Just, just just horrible. God bless them. They trying, but just God bless them. But we go to Job 36. 
and 8 through 15, we get to, we get to hear a very, a very powerful truth that happens. And it's not discussed in Christian circles today because it's just, it's just not, it's not popular. It's not popular to be under the, under the chastening of God because everything's about peace. Everything's about positive vibes and good vibes and anything that's trying to challenge how you think is just unheard of. But it's, it's got to be said, it is a beautiful thing to be chastened by God. It's a beautiful thing to be disciplined by a heavenly father. It's a beautiful thing. It may not feel good in the beginning, but we're going to get there. And I promise you we'll get there. And hopefully if I can do this at a, at a relatively good time, we'll be able to make this work. But we you start at Job chapter uh, 36 and we go to a very important chapter here. This is where Job, is, his friends are now trying to confront him and talk to him. And we go to 36 and go to down to chapter, uh, ch- chapter 36 and go to verse 8. If people are bound with chains and trapped by the cords of affliction, God tells them that they have done and how arrogantly they have tr- transgressed. God tells them what they have done and how arrogantly they have transgressed. Very interesting. He opens their ears to correction and insists they repent from iniquity. If they serve him obediently, they will end their days in prosperity and their years in happiness. But if they do not obey, they will cross the river of death and die without knowledge. Those who have a godless heart harbor anger. Even when God binds them, they do not cry for help. They die in their youth. Their life ends amongst male cult and prostitutes. God rescues the afflicted by their affliction. He instructs them by their torment. Now, this is powerful, powerful truth. Though aimed at the wrong person. Because they're under the assumption that Job did some great sin. And this is why all this calamity has happened. They weren't privy to, you know, God and the devil's conversation. They just come along, and many of people do this all the time, including myself. I've done this. You see someone in affliction, you see someone in torment, you see someone in pain, and we assume you must have done something great to God. And the truth is, there's different. There's there's types of afflictions and pains. Job's dealing with a very personal one: loss of family, loss of finances, loss of health, his status. I mean, you, even the dogs were barking at him. They probably loved Job before, come up wagging the tail, licking his feet. Now they can't stand him. They're hissing. Snakes are hissing. Birds are dropping everything. Just Job's in a bad place. But to discuss what's happening with us, when we sin in adultery, whether we thieve, we steal, we're lying and cheating, when those transgressions get so great, we're disciplined through those things. Because we have a a holy character that we must adhere to. You understand? We have to abide in the very walk of Christ. We are to act and practice holiness. And that is not easy for us. We know it. You know it. It's not easy for us to walk in something that we have no identification with. We were born and and raised in sin by sinners in a sinful world. We have no idea what it is to act in holiness. A good example is somebody said to me, I'm honest to a fault. It's one of the greatest liars you'll ever met. Someone says I'm totally transparent. Polly has more secrets in the closet than anybody because you're sinners by nature. This is what we do. The more a person is convinced of his own character, the more he's lying to himself. The word of God just says so. God tells you what they have done and how arrogantly they have transgressed. I know myself better than you do. No, really, you don't. The heart is desperately wicked. Desperate. And man tries to justify himself in his own eyes. So we don't get the privy of understanding deeply of ourselves. Thank God we have the Holy Spirit that kind of gives, digs in when we're trying to get introspective and gazing at our navels. He comes and tells us, look, man, you messed up. And God has a way of growing our characters in our distress. And he does it in a very loving, in a very supportive manner, more so than anything that we've ever experienced. We just have to make notes of how he does those things. Now, a good examination of that, even though it's a very hard one, is David's situation. When David sinned against God by laying down with Bathsheba, another man's wife, then sending Uriah to the front lines to get killed, 
after the wife turns up pregnant, his wife turns up pregnant. And it, it's just, the calamity is great. And we can find that in 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. The NAS says, Now, when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. David committed the one sin that we, that we all know very well. 1 John 2, 16, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of one's life. I mean, we see that. We saw that in Genesis chapter 3 when Eve looked upon the fruit. So David is committing the very sins that we know about because we each do it. Our sins are with our eyes. As my wife was like, say, our eye gates need to be protected. So as we can see, if we go to Genesis chapter 3, it says here, verse in verse 6, the woman saw the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that was desirable for attaining wisdom. It was desirable to look at. Same thing with David. He was looking at her like Eve was looking at that fruit. She was delicious. I got to have that. And much like the forbidden fruit, you cannot touch a man's wife. You can't touch a, a woman's husband. The fruit was delicious. They wanted some of it. He wanted it bad. He woke up in the middle of the night. Everybody else has munchies. Everybody else gets up in the middle of the night, and I'm guilty of that. Everybody's getting up in the middle of the night looking for something to eat on, looking for something to snack on, looking for something to put in their mouth. And David said, I want to put that woman in my mouth. Sorry to be so, so forward of that, but that's what he's thinking. He's As we're sitting up there snacking, he's looking at her going, man, that is beautiful. And what did David do? He's already committed a, he already committed sin in his own eyes. He already did it. Already the sin has begun. Job 31.1 says, and the Amplified says, I've made a covenant, an agreement with my eyes. How then could I gaze lustfully at a virgin? He's al he already committed the act. The physical nature of the woman doesn't matter anymore. He's already laid down. He's already in his mind imagined what it would be like. Guilty of it. It sounds like porn addiction at, at its early age. We see it. Lusting after something. And that can come from a lot of different directions, a lot of different ways. Mainly, I think the main ways where this comes from is dissatisfaction with what you have. Dissatisfaction with your position. Every man and woman hears through it. You know, you may do it. It may, it may maybe come out crossing a job. You may be lusting after another job because the money is not as good where you're sitting. You may start lusting after something that God says, no, you can't have that. But since it looks so good because it's something you haven't had before. And let's face it, everybody likes something new. Very few people respect what's old. It's just true. If you ever look at nursing homes and how many people are put in there that are still healthy if they don't want to take care of it. It's too much, too much hassle. New is always, new car smells way better than the 20-year-old car you have. That's where it all begins. So we look at David's life. David suffers. David's dealing with it. So right now, we woke up in the middle of the night. He's hungry. He sees a woman bathing. So I, I got to have some of this. Got to have some of this. Who is this woman? So he gets his man, and he gets his man involved, Joab, and say, "Who is this Bathsheba woman?" And Joab, well, that's just Uriah's wife. Uriah's wife, yeah, you mean one of your men? You know, he's one of your boys. Good man, you know. And he married her. He's like Dave was probably was shocked. Uriah had something like that. That's his. Wow, I gotta have that. Being king, what can you do? What can you do? So let's look at David's sins real quick. Let's do a tally real fast. What did he do? He lusted with his eyes. First thing he did. We already saw that that trample happen in Job 31. Right? He's already made a covenant. He's already made an agreement in his mind and imagined himself with this woman. He's already done it. And we know that breaks God's law. Exodus twenty seventeen. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Male servant, female servant, even his donkey. Don't, don't. Nothing that that man had, David should have been lusting after or desiring. He's king. He has everything. But he wasn't satisfied with it. He had that itch and that craving that he just had to, had to scratch. He had to itch. He had to satisfy. It. He got the bump on the tongue. He had to have it. Then he got poor Joab mixed into it. Poor Joab gets mixed up in it now. Now, how'd that happen? What did Joab do? David said, what? Send him to the front of the line. Get him to the front of the line, 
get him killed. Don't when you see him, get him to the front of the line and abandon him up there. Get him up there. I I, I need this woman, man. Get, get him up there. And if you probably didn't give him the whole story, that'd be too easy. Because then, of course, you know you keep, you know two people can't keep a secret unless one's dead. So Joab didn't, they probably didn't know everything about it, but he did do what David commanded. David, he sent that man to the front line. Verse fourteen. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab. Sent it. Sent it with Uriah. So not it's not enough. It's not enough that David is already is conspiring to get this man killed so he can have his have his wife. It's not enough to where this man, he could have it. And what's worse? What's worse? It's another man's wife. He says, Rye, come on in. Come on in. Come here, Rye. I want you to take this letter. Send it to Joab. And in this letter is his death note. Literally, his death sentence is being, he's delivering his own death sentence. Look at verse six. David sent orders to Joab. Send me Uriah the Hittite. So Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked Joab and the troops were doing and how the war was going. And he said, Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace and a gift from the king followed him. But Uriah stepped to the door of the palace with all his male servants, with master servants. He did not go down to his house. When it was reported to David, Uriah didn't go home. David questioned Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why didn't you go home? Uriah answered, David, the ark of Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents, and my master Joab and his soldiers are camping in the open field. How can I enter my house to eat and drink and sleep with my wife? As surely as you live and by your life, I will not do this. Stay here today, David said to Uriah. And tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and, and, and to the next. Then David invited Uriah to eat and drink with him. And David got him drunk. He went out to the evening to lie down on his cot with his master's servants. But he did not go home. So here's Uriah trying to be a faithful servant. Trying to be a faithful warrior to David. Trying to do the right thing. Trying not to take any creature comforts. And David's liquoring him up. David's chastising him first. Why he didn't go home and go get with your wife? Then he's trying, now he's trying to liquor him up and get this man in good, in good standing. And all the while, David's heart is dark. I mean, this is bad, right? I mean, what kind of bribery is this? This is bad. Looks like he's trying to get him away from him as soon as possible. Sound like he's being a king, but he's, there's some dirt in his voice. The next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. And in the note, put your eyes in front of the fiercest fighting, then withdraw from him so that he is struck down and die. Wow. And Uriah did it. He, now, not, not only David, now first of all, it's not enough that David slept with another man's wife, got her pregnant, got her pregnant. You know, verse four, you know, he sent messengers to go get her. And when she came to him, he slept with her. Now she had just been purifying herself from her uncleanliness. After she returned home, the woman conceived and sent word to inform David she's pregnant. Not even off from her period. And she's already back. She's already, she just purified herself. Now she's pregnant. Slept with the king, another man's wife. Here we are. The, the, the table is set. The sin is great. Child conceived in adultery. Not enough for David yet. Now David now conceives of a murder, puts a murder plot, gives the death sentence to Uriah to deliver to Joab. Joab now is an accomplice to the murder. Doesn't know why, probably. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. He's complicit now. If David's king, you can't say no to him. Now David's got an accomplice. Now there's another person involved in it. We got another person involved now. And Uriah's slain. Uriah's slain. Verse 17, the men of the city came out and attacked Joab. And some of the men from David's soldiers fell in battle. Uriah the Hittite also died. It's bad, man. It's bad, 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 bad times. And how was David confronted? It was harsh. It's very harsh how he was confronted. He was confronted. But we can see Proverbs six eighteen: a heart that devises wicked plans 
feet that make haste to run the evil. He did that. Matthew 5, 28, when David first laid his eyes on her, but I say to you, everyone that looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. David's already in a bad place right now. Broken God's law. Shall not murder. He committed murder. He didn't pull the trigger, but he instituted the murder. He got it together. That's a conspiracy, brothers and sisters. That'll get you. That'll get you sentenced. He's held accountable to that. He's held accountable. So here's, here's David in a bad place right now. He's in a really, really bad place. And he probably thinks he got away with it. He probably thinks, you know what? I, I got away with it. He's dead. So now she's a widow. I can do something now. Now I can, I can make some moves. Now the cover-ups began, right? More than likely covering up his trail, covering up the letter. Letter's probably burned at this point. Things have gone down. He, you know, he's probably thinking, I think I've gotten away with this now. I think I think I might have been able to get through. And I think I've, I, I, I don't think I've left any evidence behind. David probably thinks he's in the clear. Then we got the prophet Nathan coming up. Now we got a problem. We got a problem. We got to read this to you. This is very important. Nathan comes up and says, David, I got a problem, man. He goes, what's that? And he says, I, there's a hypothetical problem. I, there's, it's a hypothetical situation. Man comes along, comes up. Now, let me read this to you. This, this is uh, this now following the next chapter in, in 2 Samuel, verse 12. Watch this. Start at verse 2. So the Lord sent Nathan, oh, sorry, verse one, sorry. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, oh man, this, this is bad news, brother, but you got to hear this. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he arrived, he said to him, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and one poor. The rich man had very large flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one small ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised her, she grew up with him and with his children. From his meager food she would eat, from his cup she would drink, and in the arms she would sleep. She was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man could not bring himself to take one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for his guest. Now we can see that you can see the, the you see what's happening here, right? Nathan's saying what? Uriah didn't have nothing. David had everything. And when a traveler came, David says, you know what? I don't want to slaughter all that I have. I'm going to take the most precious thing to Uriah and sacrifice it instead. What is he saying? What is he saying? Now, listen to David. This is the hypocrite, the hypocrite David is right now. We can all relate to this son. David was infuriated with the man and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Because he has done this thing and shown no pity. He must pay four lambs for that lamb. David says what? Man, if this man exists, if this has happened, this is a travesty, let's put him to death. Bring him to me. We'll let him, we'll die, we'll kill him right here. Nathan said, verse 7, Nathan replied to David, you are the man. This is what the Lord God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from Saul. I gave you your master's house to you and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And that was not enough. Wow. That was not enough. I would have given you more. Why then have you despised the Lord's command by doing what I consider evil? You struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and took his wife as your own. You murdered him with the Amorite sword. Now, that just throws everything out the door, right? David, could, David can't say, wait a minute, I didn't do it. The Amorites did. No, he didn't. It was as if David took the sword himself and struck Uriah down by his own hand. All from covet covetedness. He wanted what Uriah had because David didn't have enough. We just discussed that's why we sin, right? 
because we're not happy with what we have. We just got to have more. And that is in every human being on this earth. No one is ever satisfied with what they have. And so they got to have more. And the sin is conceived and they go out and go get it. It's not enough to be angry. You got to find more reasons to be angry. It ain't enough to have one job. You got to have more money at that job. It's not enough that God has given you. You want to take more. And God says what? I'm willing to give it to you, but it'll happen on my will. It'll happen when it's my time to give it to you, not based on what you're doing. He told David, I was, I was willing to give you more, but it wasn't enough. You were not satisfied with God's provisions. You wanted David's provisions. Does that sound familiar to us, brothers and sisters? That sounds like me and you, right? We want our provisions. God, I know you've given me this, but I want this as well. You've given me a marriage, but I want more than the marriage. You've given me this job, I want more than just this job. You've given me this car, I want more than just this car. We dig debt on instinct. Every one of us digs ourselves our own grave every day. If it wasn't for Christ, we'd be dead right now in our sins. The minute we were born, we were born with a shovel in our hand and we were digging ourselves a grave. If it wasn't for Christ, we'd be dead today. Listen, everything that God has given us, brothers and sisters, is why we fall short in sin, because it's just not enough. Our hunger for more is just not enough. We have to be satisfied in Christ. We have to be satisfied in Christ. So the warnings are there. If we go to the scripture, the warning is there. We just got to be conscientious of it. We got to be willing to listen to what the Lord has for us. But the problem is we don't. We want what we want. And it doesn't work that way. We got to want what God wants. We got to want what God wants. And we got to want to do it his way. His way is perfect. Our way is broken. So we need some practical ways, right? We need some practical ways so we don't fall victim to what David did. Here's a, here's, here's a warning from Job. Verse 36, verse 18 and 21. Listen to this. Well, we already read through 21, but look, look at verse 18. Let's just concentrate on that in verse 19. Even go to verse 22. Sorry, I'm getting, just it, they're all so rich verses. So be careful. This is Job 36, 18, right? Be careful that no one lures you with riches. Do not let a large ransom lead you astray. There's a good warning right there. Do not let someone lure you away according to your sins. You may be, in Luke chapter 17, verse 1, verse 1 and 2, the Lord says, you are bound to sin, but woe to those who bring sin into your life. Be careful what that person that brings them to you. And someone, if you're sitting there, a job offer comes, and Lord has placed you in this job, and a new one comes that promises greater and better things because the job you have doesn't exactly pay all the bills you want. It doesn't exactly do all the things you want. It gives you the provisions that God has allowed you to have, but you want more. So someone comes along and offers it. Be careful of that offer. Don't take it. Don't take it. Second, don't let a large ransom lead you astray. Don't let something that seems too good to be true lure you out. Whatever that fleshly thing that you've attached to that said, man, if I get this thing, this will satisfy me. If it's from the flesh, and it is because it ain't from God, don't do it. Don't lead into it. Because it says what? It'll lead you astray. You will walk off from where God is. You will stray from the shepherd. And you'll be afflicted. Verse 19. Can your wealth or all your physical exertion keep you from distress? 
it is easy for us to start comfort eating, buying new things, to try to comfort us when we're going through the problems that's happening in our life. And those things cannot comfort. They are temporary creature comforts that the world promises. And God is not going to comfort you through those. God's not going to comfort you through a new house because you're feeling sad. God's not going to comfort you through with, with a new spouse, even though you're already married. He's not going to comfort you with sin. He's only going to comfort you with himself. Do you hear that? He will comfort you with himself. That's what God wants us to be comforted with. This is what we want. This is what he wants for us. This is what he wants for us. Look at Psalm 37, 4. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. David had the desires of his heart and it wasn't enough because he wasn't taking comfort in God. He took comfort in his eyes and what he could see. We do it. I'm guilty of it. You're guilty of it. And if you're not, you're much better. You're much better than about a million plus Christians every day. Every time you look upon what you think is good for you, you are going against God. Delight yourself in the Lord. So that's one main reason why we sin. We're not delighting ourselves in the very things that God's given us. We're not satisfied with our lot in life. So, And I'm guilty of this. I can only preach it and teach it to you because I'm guilty of it. Looking outside because you have everything you want, but it ain't enough. You're not satisfied. And God will judge that behavior. How? By disciplining us. David's discipline was harsh. Harsh. But it was merciful. It was merciful. Because he didn't, the sword was never taken away from David. Should have. That was merciful. The sword was taken from David, Christ would not be here. If the rain was taken from David, Christ would not be here. He left David who he was, but he took something precious of David, David's child. That child was sick, and God struck him down with it. And God punished David by punishing, by using the child. And God was no less just or holy for doing so. That child was spared. A life of sin. Oh, look at other David's boys. Absalom. David, David wrecked what he sold greatly. But this child that was born out of murder, this child was conceived in darkness. Darkness was surrounding this child. And God did not punish the child. He punished David. The child was taken up to God, mercifully taken. David suffered. David suffered a calamity of great proportion. That's the word today, right? Calamity. David was still God's man. David was still God's man. David should have died. He didn't. Should have, but he didn't. Look at Psalms 103.10. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. Thank God for that, right? If he dealt with us harshly, David would be dead today. If he dealt with you the way you deserve, you wouldn't be hearing me. I, you, I wouldn't be listening to you. You wouldn't hear anybody. If we got what we deserve, we would not be here today. The unmerited favor of God is through Jesus Christ. And he rescued us from hell itself. And that still doesn't satisfy our hearts enough. But thankfully, we have a Holy Spirit that has been given us a down payment, a deposit that lives within us every day. That the Lord uses to correct us. His own spirit is correcting us. So now that we had the warnings of what those three, let's, let's look at three positives or four. Let's look at four positives that happens when we're being dealt with in our sins. And this is some serious business. Four things that we can take away from this that should give us some encouragement about what's happening. 
First one, we we got to look at what it. I mean, and this look, it's, discipline's never easy. Discipline is never easy. Ever, it's never easy. Hurts greatly, but we can take comfort in the fact of why this is going on. We can take some comfort in that. Here's the first one. We will be disciplined as sons because we are sons of God. That's an identity, that's an identity confirmation right there. We are what? I, we can identify ourselves by who we are in Christ. We are sons and daughters of Christ. Listen to verse, look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Endure suffering as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had, we, we had remained fathers discipline us. We had human fathers discipline us and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the father of spirits, the father of the spirits and live? There's some more insight. We are sons and daughters of God. Don't reject his discipline. Don't reject his discipline. And if we respected our own parents, then we need to even be more so respect what the Lord tells us. If, the, if our parents tell us to wash dishes, then the Lord should say, wash your body, wash your mind, clean your mind, and we should be willing to submit to that as well. That's comforting. We are children of God. Second, our character will be grown and our faith will be bolstered. First Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7. You rejoice in this. Even now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. The trials that we're discussing today is when we sin and God's disciplining us. And verse 7 tells us why. So that a proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which through perishable is refined by fire. We all know when we come under fire... God is the one that sends it. And fire refines us and our character. In the process of this, we may result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We wait. We wait eagerly until we're out of this sinful fleshly body or perfected by Christ. Until then, these griefs that we suffer because when God's disciplined us, whether he's separating us from our spouses, whether we, we, we're demoted at our jobs for whatever, or for, for us do, maybe dis, you know, conspiring to do things we shouldn't do, you know, whatever the manner of we being judged for our sin, I mean judged in a sense of we're being disciplined, we know that this is for the glory of God. And this is going to help build our character and strengthen our faith. When we start relying less on us and more on him, things will become great. Look at another one here. We will have our minds renewed and know the will of God. Verse Romans chapter 12, verse 2. These, these verses are over and over. You hear it all the time, but they're here for our benefit. These should never get old. They should never become, oh, here we go again with that same verse. No, these verses are for our enrichment. For our enrichment. Let's go to 2 Timothy 3.16. Let's, let's continue to understand why. This Bible is important. Why this instruction is important. Why we keep hearing the same thing over and over again. Because it's truthful. It's useful. It's beautiful. Man, this is, this is good stuff. This is good stuff. We, we, can't, we can't ignore this. 2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is inspired by God. And it's profitable for teaching, for rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Why? So in Romans 12, 2, we know what? Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good and pleasing, perfect will of God that happens when we are disciplined in our sin because of our sins. Our minds are being renewed. We're being shown. Do not go to your former lusts like you used to do. Don't fall into those same habits again. If those habits of you keep falling into, lean more on God. I have to say, that's me. Them habits are old. They get there. They've been there for a while. They've been there for a while. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. 
Verse 20, but that is how you come to know Christ. Assuming you've heard about him, you are taught by him as the truth is in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and put on the new self, one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. I'm suffering through that. What about you? I'm getting reminded of that every day. I'm fighting these, these battles of the flesh. Are you fighting them with me, brothers and sisters? I'm sure you are. That old form of way of life happens because the old form of way of life, we've been educated from birth that it's not enough to have what you have now. You've got to have more. You don't have an iPhone X until, you, until the next iPhone has come out. You don't have the latest Galaxy 15. 16 is already being promoted and you just got your hands on the 15. We're just not satisfied from commercials to your friends on Instagram and Facebook. Anything that you have new, they have something newer and it creates this appetite that is never filled. That is sin. Sin can never be full. You can never fill it. You can't commit enough in your addiction, in your adultery, in your pornography. You can't do enough to satisfy. It's always waiting again. We got to delight ourselves in the Lord. We've got to accept the discipline that has come. And we've got to turn to that new man, which goes to number four, right? Put on the new man. Put on the new man. The new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. That's what we got to do. That's what we got to do. Discipline causes us to confess our sin that we've not dealt with in a way that discipline is cleansing. It's also a growth catalyst. The more we know about God, the more we know about his desires for our lives. Discipline presents, prevents us, I'm sorry, presents to us an opportunity to learn and to conform ourselves to the image of Christ. Brothers and sisters, discipline is a good thing. Is God disciplining you right now? Has he taken something that you've, that you've enjoyed and loved and tend, has taken for granted because it wasn't enough and you had to do something to it for it had to be removed? Don't be mad at God for that. If it's from him, it's preserved, but you got to get fixed. You got to be disciplined. He has to deal with you so we can move on to what that thing that God has promised you. That's for you. So you don't fall victim, can continually fall victim like David did, always looking for Bathsheba and always getting Uriah killed. Your dreams are like Uriah. Got just, we, we destroy them. Our families are like Uriah. Our jobs have been like Uriah. We've sent death notes with them because of our sin, because we wanted something more than what we had. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. Thank you for this word. I pray that this message reaches those that it looks like it reached me, Lord, and that you discipline us continually as sons and daughters. I ask that you continue to watch over us and guide us, Lord, as you always do through your Holy Spirit. And I ask that you continue to show the same mercy you show to us every morning for when we have a new life that you've given us. And let our mind be set towards you, Father, that we can always try to to, to, to aspire to be holy and righteous by your demands and your commands, Lord, and you give us the strength to be able to do so. By us just keeping our eye on the author and finisher of our faith in your son, Jesus Christ, I ask all these things. Amen. Now, you can also look at my YouTube channel. It's not very exposed. It's not very big, but I'm going to try to put some videos on there to try to, you know, maximize this ministry the best I can. Again, I told you earlier, uh, I've not done a really good job of explaining what UNHD means, but thank God that God has been giving me you know, pushings and urgings every year to finally learn what that means. And so you'll get more of a, a video of what that looks like. And I continue to ask you to pray for me and my family. Pray for us. And it's like I pray for you. And thank you for the support of this channel. Uh, you can find me on Instagram is at, at the real, at, sorry, at the Eric Miller. Uh, that's E-R-I-C-K, of course, the Eric Miller. And you can also find me on Twitter. But more importantly, find me on uh, Spreaker.com forward slash UNHD. You'll be able to find all of the things you have by using hashtag UNHD. You'll find everything I've ever done. 
Uh, I just appreciate all that you've done for me. I pray that God is continuing to lifting you up. I love you very dearly. In Jesus' name, amen. You have just listened to You in HD, your identity in Jesus Christ with Pastor Eric Miller. This ministry is made possible by your thoughtful prayers and donations. Join us each week as we continue to explore our Christian identity in Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.